Welcome back. I'm That Chemist, and today we have another very special episode of Toxic. That's right, we're covering another paper from the infamous Figueroa. Special author covering special papers using his own unique brand of chemistry. So I'm going to just go through and start reading this, and we're going to highlight a few things as we go through. Several studies for the synthesis of bicyclo-331 nonane analogs have been reported. However, there is little information on the preparation of bicyclo-331 nonane steroid derivatives. We're going to put a pin in that and come back to that. The chemical structure was evaluated through NMR spectroscopic analysis. The results showed higher yield for 11 compared with 12. That doesn't really tell us anything from the NMR, but, you know, whatever. They, it's just two unrelated statements. That's fine. It is noteworthy that the reagents used in this investigation are not expensive and do not require special conditions for handling. Now, you might remember from the last episode, which I'll put a card to here, where Figueroa actually used this exact same line. Now, in most of the papers that we've seen from Figueroa so far, normally he states the megahertz of the NMR, and when we get to the carbon NMR, it always hurts. However, in this case, he didn't even say megahertz or hertz in this entire paper. Okay, so let's continue. For several years, some derivatives of uh, bicyclo331 non a have been prepared using different protocols. And one of the protocols he talks about uses selenium as a catalyst, or so he says. However, they do not use selenium. They do use a selenium-based reagent, but they don't use it catalytically. And I'm just going to show this to you. So they make this bicyclo species here. This is from a different paper from Nikolaus group. And you can see they go from here to here using this uh, acronym here, NPSP. And so you can see a selenium is added. And then we're just going to go to the next page. And you can see NPSP, n phenyl is used with 1.1 equivalents. So Figueroa was mistaken here. They also mention some other methods using some enol derivatives um, that were also prepared. Other data included the, or indicated the synthesis of another bicyclo-331 non derivative. But, you know, that is what it is. So earlier I said we were going to put a pin in something. And so right here we see also a spiro bicyclo 3222 one cyclohexane steroid derivative. Spiroaspertrione A was developed from farnesyl pyrophosphate and 5,7-dihydroxy-4,6-dimethyl-3H isobenzofuran one own So here he's saying there actually has been another steroid derivative prepared with a bicyclo system. And so, you know, it says there's little information on the preparation. So maybe maybe the little bit of information is just that one entire paper. There's just a, there's just a little bit of information. Okay, so all these data show different protocols for the preparation of several bicyclo-331 no-name derivatives. However, there are few data regarding the synthesis of bicyclo-322 uh, no-name derivatives bound to the steroid nucleus. So they do show different protocols, but in this paper, we're also going to see for each reaction that there's different protocols, because that's just chemistry. You're not going to have one set of conditions with one set of reagents that works for every transformation, because chemistry requires different conditions. The aim of this research was to develop two bicyclo-321 no-nano steroid derivatives using, uh, I think this is a, a typo, but it could just be unique uh, nomenclature here, using a series of reactions such as etherification, aromatic nucleophilic substitution, 2 plus 2 addition, acylation, and an internal cyclization, which do not require special conditions. Now, you might not know what special means, but I can tell you that this episode is a special episode, and there's some of the most special Figueroa chemistry that we've seen so far on this channel, so make sure you buckle in. Experimental generalities. All reagents such as ninhydrin, 1-fluoro-2,4-dinitrobenzene, used in this investigation were acquired from Sigma Aldrich. They also say that it was done uh, using a variant spectrometer in CDCL3 using TMS as an internal standard. However, later on, we won't see any CDCL3 or TMS. Okay, so let's just go through some of the experimental, and I'm going to ignore most of the NMR other than pointing out all of the NMR spectra are clearly illegitimate, which you'll see. Dimethyl sulfoxide were stirred under reflux at 120 degrees Celsius. So you might not know this, but DMSO has a boiling point of 189. So I don't know if he has some special sort of DMSO which refluxes at a lower temperature. I've never heard of such things. 
if you've uh, worked with DMSO that boils at 120, make sure you comment down below. And then he goes ahead and removes the solvent under reduced pressure. If you have ever removed DMSO under reduced pressure, I would be very interested to know that because uh, it's it's a challenging feat, although it's technically possible. Further, he purifies his product using his favorite technique, which we've talked about a couple times now, methanol hexane water in the 3 to 1 to 1 system. Very, very special workup conditions. So he's got a couple other examples. Here you can see he uses DMSO again. This time he does it at room temp. Um, and then again, he removes the solvent under reduced pressure. Now, I'm reluctant that the solvent could be removed under reduced pressure. And like, how long would you have to pump down DMSO at room temperature to get all of the DMSO off? Like, so long. Like, I don't even think that that would be practical. Again, he does another crystallization using our favorite method, methanol water hexane. Okay, so we're just going to move forward a bit. Here you can see the same thing happens. I'm just going to gloss over this. Um, here, again, same thing happens, same thing happens. Okay, so here we can see that uh, they, again, do the same sort of procedure here, you know, no big surprise. But then what's kind of interesting is they talk about how they can use the displacement of a nitro group using various reagents. So you might be surprised to know that it is actually possible to use an aryl nitro group as a leaving group. Now, this is very rare, and while it's possible, it is not so common that you could expect that this would work in most instances. This is kind of like a rare one-off. However, they say that they're able to substitute nitro groups using ninhydrin. And I recently looked at the en Encyclopedia of Reagents in Organic Synthesis for ninhydrin. There is zero evidence that ninhydrin's two hydroxy groups are able to act as nucleophiles. More often than not, other nucleophiles come and displace those. So that's kind of weird. So the, the real sins that we have in this paper, we're gonna talk about a little bit later. Okay, there are several reports which show different aromatic nucleophilic substitution reactions. However, some of these reactions require special conditions, thus greatly limiting the possibility of their application. Again, Figueroa doesn't really tell us here what special conditions are, and he doesn't say how his chemistry is any different, so we're just going to have to take him for his word here. But fortunately, a study indicates that there is no nucleophilic substitution of a 4-nitrofluorobenzene in liquid ammonia, and only 4-nitroaniline is formed. So, correct me if I'm wrong here, but there is a nucleophilic substitution because the fluoride is displaced with ammonia. However, maybe in this one substrate, you can see that the nitro doesn't get displaced. However, if you look at the 18F paper that Figueroa references, you can actually see a case where you have 4-nitro-4-fluorobenzene, or rather 4-nitro-4-chlorobenzene, and you actually do see both the chloride and the nitro getting substituted. Okay, it was noteworthy here that they show this reaction, um, okay, but they show another reaction that we're, we're going to just go forward and then come back to this. So here they say that uh, he wants to make it really worth mentioning that they are able to substitute the fluoride of this compound using this aniline, but you don't ever get two of them. Well, why would you? There's only one fluorine there. You're not going to get both of the fluoride substituted. So I don't know why he's remarking on that. Like, if you think for some reason that that could form, I definitely want to know down below because you're aware of some really cool chemistry that I'm not aware of. Okay, so in this first reaction here, he tells you what he's going to do. He takes ninhydrin, which is compound one, and he takes this interesting looking dinitrofluorobenzene, and he claims that he is able to just completely deplanarize this ring and do an SNAR reaction. Now, nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions do occur, however, they're rarer, not impossible, they're, they're common-ish in like medchem, but in a research context, they're quite a bit less common. Um, not unheard of, especially if you're substituting an aryl fluoride with some nucleophiles. However, this case where you're taking a, a hydrated ketone and you're using those OH groups as nucleophiles to displace nitro groups on a benzene is absolutely ridiculous. Like, I would sooner believe that you could form a polymer between the hydroxy groups of uh, ninhydrin and this dinitrobenzene before this crazy strained ring would form. This is just terrible. This is one of the most terrible Figueroa proposals I've ever seen. Okay. 
And so fortunately, he's going to give us a mechanism to tell us how this happens. So first, using potassium carbonate as a base, he forms a benzyne through the elimination of nitrous acid, or nitrite, as a leaving group. Unfortunately here, he doesn't draw it as nitrite. You can see that that arrow is a little bit damaged. The, the point of the arrow has been separated and kind of like sticky taped back on. Um, okay, and then he does this, where uh, one of the hydroxy groups adds into the benzene and simultaneously gets deprotonated by the benzene. And uh, then another potassium carbonate comes along, forms a second benzene, except it isn't a benzene in this case. He draws this really, really cursed looking, like, tri-aline. It's like a double aline. This is just painful. Uh, and then the same thing happens where he draws the alkene, except in this case it's an aline, grabbing the proton, and then the OH is attacked by the other carbon. Now, the really concerning thing here is, let's just stop for a second. This alkyne has two electrons attacking. Because in chemistry, we look at the movement of electrons, right? We don't look at the movement of uh, positive charges. We look at the movement of negative charges. Uh, okay, so this is giving just like uh, a negative charge attacking to both of them. Somehow this doesn't get positively charged. And somehow a nucleophile is attacking at an oxygen. Wow, just wow. Okay, and so the same thing happens here. Just really wow. Okay, so then he takes this uh, this compound uh, here and treats it with 3-ethyl aniline, and he says he does an SNAR. This is probably the most possible thing that he's proposed in this whole paper. I would believe that that type of thing might work. I don't know if it would work this well, uh, but, you know, maybe it would work. He would also get it as the salt, but, you know, maybe he does work up. I don't think he does, but whatever. Okay. Um, there's a couple other concerning statements here. You can see he was looking at the NMR for one of the compounds, and the 13C NMR showed bands. Now, I'm not familiar with seeing bands in a carbon NMR. If you've ever seen bands in a carbon NMR, I definitely want to know about it. And uh, he wasn't sure where compound 4 was, but he found it at a specific mass in the mass spectrum. So he did find it. He found the compound. He looked exactly where it would show up, and he found it. Good for him. Okay. So... Uh, Compound 6 was prepared using two different methods. Uh, he was able to react 3, uh, which is this, um, where is 3 here? 3, this compound here, with uh, ethyl aniline. So he's just substituting that fluoride once he's put his funky ninhydrin on there. But then he was also able to use method B, where uh, he first added in the ethyl aniline and then did his, anhydrin, his ninhydrin chemistry. Um, and so he just says that he did this a couple different ways. However, when he talks about compound 6, which is this one shown here, he says uh, the mass was found at 376.05, and you can see here that the exact mass is actually 367.08. So this is the incorrect mass. I don't know how he found something where it wasn't. Okay, several cyclobutene have been prepared using reagents such as organolithium derivative, rhodium, palladium, nickel, cobalt complexes, copper 1. In this study, a cyclobutene derivative was prepared via 2 plus 2 cycloaddition of an alkyne derivative to estradiol or estrone using copper 2 as catalysts. So, um, yeah, let's look at, let's, uh, let's go forward and see what that looks like. Okay, so scheme 5, let's go to scheme 5. So what he's saying is he can just take uh, estradiol, which you can't see here, but imagine that we had this piece cut off and this is just a benzene ring. He's saying you could do a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition between this alkyne and a benzene ring. And that he's just cool with saying that happens. So that's kind of wild. We're not even going to comment on how ridiculous this chemistry is regardless, because we still got this like dorky looking ninhydrin on there. Uh, but just wow, right? Incredible. So he did use copper. So it, it didn't just happen spontaneously. He used copper. You know, there's there's copper in there. That that might do something. Uh, in this next example, you can see that um, he found signals in the 1HNMR spectrum for uh, a methyl group li linked to a steroid nucleus. Now, if you showed me a methyl group at 0 0.9 ppm, I probably wouldn't be able to tell you whether it came from a steroid nucleus or some other methyl group. I think it's a bit of a stretch to say that it came from a steroid nucleus, but nonetheless whatever. Okay, other signals from 13 CNMR spectrum were found. I'm really glad that he found them because I, you know, I don't know what he would have done if he didn't find them. 
Some reports have shown the acylation of alcohol groups using several reagents. This is fine. Like the, the things he's talking about are like excessive, very extravagant. Um, but some of them require special conditions. Again, very ambiguous, very mysterious. Analyzing these data, in this investigation, the compounds 7 or 8 were acylated with chloroacetyl chloride in the presence of triethylamine to form the compounds 9 or 10. Now that's reasonable. This is the second reaction, which I would say is believable. It's actually probably the most believable reaction. I would believe that the uh, alcohols would be able to react with chloroacetyl chloride. It is noteworthy that the 1-HNMR spectrum for compound 9 showed signals at 0.8 ppm for the methyl group linked to the steroid nucleus. I don't think that that's noteworthy. Uh, if you had a methyl group before, I'm going to hope you had a methyl group after. That's, that's not that noteworthy. It's not noteworthy for me. Okay, so there's the scheme we just looked at. And now we're getting to the special part. So you can see that the uh, alcohol groups react with chloroacetyl chloride. Fairly reasonable. You know, the fact that he has this de-aromatized 6-4 fused system that doesn't really want to exist, he, he's fine with that. So, okay. Um, the mass spectrum signal, that's kind of concerning. Here he says, there are studies which show the cyclization of halide derivatives with internal double bond. So this is just talking about palladium mediated cyclization, and he's got conditions for alternative ones. Based on these data, in this study, a dihydrofuran 2 own ring was involved in the chemical structure of 11 or 12 formed via internal reaction of chloride with double bond in, ma in a basic medium. Now, none of these are basic conditions. So where are he where is he getting these conditions from? Now it gets worse. Like I'm just gonna like tease you for a minute and not show you that reaction yet, but that reaction is one of the worst Figueroa sins in this whole paper. It should be mentioned that there are several signals in the 13 CNMR spectrum. In addition, the mass spectrum from compound 12 was found at 679.25. He found the mass spectrum. He was looking at something, and he found the mass spectrum. I don't know how he found the mass spectrum, but good for him. Okay, so this reaction is pretty cursed. You can see he does some conditions, and this one clicks on here. Okay. In this next one, you can see he's got a different compound. This one has a chloroacetyl group on the other alcohol, and at least he's recognized here that this can't do any fancy stuff. It's, this just stays. But here, they he shows that this chloroacetyl group is able to just click onto the benzene ring, and uh, the non-benzene ring, because this is not aromatic, and the other double bond stays. This double bond's gone. And he just does this uh, with sodium hydroxide in DMSO at reflux. Um, if you know what happens when you put DMSO in a basic medium at high temperatures, comment down below for those who are uninformed. Okay, so this is the mechanism. Doesn't involve NaOH, okay? There's no NaOH in this me mechanism. So first what happens is this double bond moves its electrons uh, into this alpha position and it creates a positive charge. Then chloride leaves on its own and creates a carbanion. Uh, okay, those are both very wrong. This anion is then able to attack this carbocation, forming the bond. At no point was any hydroxide required, and uh, we don't know how a hydrogen got put in that position. Figueroa never told us how he did that. Figueroa is uh, a man of magic. Here we go, first NMR spectrum. This looks uh, not like any NMR I've ever seen, other than uh, perhaps a stylistic rendition made in uh, Microsoft Paint, potentially. Who knows? You got some other ones. All the Figaro spectra are just very impressive. You know, it's very abstract. Um, he used a series of reactions, and it's noteworthy that the used reagents are easy to handle and do not require specific conditions. But he reported that he used specific conditions. So, I mean, in my opinion, he did require specific conditions. And he also let us know that the presence of functional groups involved in their chemical structure was confirmed using both 1H and 13C NMR. So this is the this is the end of Figaro's paper here. You can see that we got some really special chemistry going on. We have, you know, unique mechanisms that have never been proposed in history ever before coming to light for the first time. I, I, I think mechanisms like this really bring me back to like teaching undergraduate lab where you see some crazy mechanisms drawn out that are just not at all right. And uh, I guess this is what happens when you don't edit people and you don't correct their mistakes. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you like and subscribe, and I hope you have a great day.